people that change swap dragons for Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> actually, have all of our characters got amnesia? <laughs> yeah. Released in 2011, still thought of as a current game. Just updated last week, so you know that alone shows longevity. It shows how popular it is. Hello and welcome to the best ever. Time for another pop culture showdown. I'm Morgan Jeffrey, executive editor at RadioTimes.com, joined once again by a panel of guests. Each of them has come armed with an opinion. Their job is to convince me that their pick, and only theirs, deserves the title of the best ever. This episode, we're loading up a tough one. What is the best ever video game? Joining me on the panel are L. Osley Wood, TV presenter and voice of BBC Radio 3 Sound of Gaming, James Batchelor, editor-in-chief at gamesindustry.biz, and Rob Lean, gaming editor at radiotimes.com. Thank you all for joining me. L. No spoilers just yet as to your pick for the best ever video game, but what are the qualities that are important in any game to grab you? So, of course, the technical craft. Mm. So the, the game itself, the world building, the storytelling, the technical aspects like combat, that kind of thing, those are going to be essential. We can't say any game is great unless those fundamentals are there. But then I also think things like community and impact mm. Also sales, you know, these are all aspects that I think we should be considering as to the kind of, as I said, impact a game has had mm. in the industry, in the community, and how it's shaped its player experience, both inside and outside the game. Mm. So you're going to bring all of that to the table here today. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to see that from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> James, thousands upon thousands of potential choices for this. Uh, how difficult was it to pick a favourite video game of all time? Very. Because, <laughs> because there's a difference between favourite and best ever. Like my, everyone's favourite will be different. My yeah. favourite game, not even close to being the best game ever, but I love it. Like, you want to give that one a quick shout out? Yeah, sure. Thief 2, The Metal Age. Okay. No, half the people, <laughs> more than half the people watching will have no idea what I'm on about. But for me, it's my favourite game of all time. I wouldn't even dare to suggest it for this. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Like, it, it, I'll be honest, I kind of started looking at other lists and seeing like what have other people said as best game <laughs> and do I agree? Um, and then there was one like quite common one, it's like actually, yeah, that, that was definitely a contender for me. Mm. It's it's undeniably one of the best ever. Mm. So hopefully I can defeat whatever Elle's brought with us. <laughs> well, Rob, Elle and, and James, I'm sure know their stuff. How confident are you that you have something up your sleeve. I mean, you're not even wearing sleeves. But, but how confident <laughs> are you that you have, so there, yeah. <laughs> you have something in your pocket, perhaps, um, that will blow away the competition and secure you our best ever trophy? Oh, I do want the trophy. <laughs> yeah, see, I've kind of taken the opposite approach to James and just picked my favourite game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one I could kind of argue for all day, talk about all day. Definitely, like, my standout experience. And, like, for me, it's a very nostalgic one as well. Mm. And I think, like... A lot of people, if you ask them their favourite games or, or best games, they would probably draw back to something they remember really loving at kind of a formative point in their kind of development as a gamer. So that's mm. more the route I've gone down. Mm. Um, so I don't know how this will pay off, but I will <laughs> find out. Well, today's winner will be awarded our coveted best ever trophy. Think of this as the Super Smash Brothers of pop culture debate. <laughs> uh, well, well, let's get into it then. El, we'll start with you. In your opinion, what is the best ever video game? Okay. Skyrim. That's what I've gone for. So I want to give a quick shout out to Bioshock. I, I, I really thought about Bioshock for a very long time, but I have had to go with Skyrim. And my pitch could just be, it's Skyrim. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to do this justice. It's got such a huge community. It's so beloved that I didn't feel like I could just wing it. So please bear with me. So first of all, obviously facts. Released in 2011, still thought of as a current game. Just updated last week. So, you know, that alone shows longevity, it shows how popular it is, eight platforms, three generations, we've you know, seen it on every console that you can think of currently. So that shows you know, audiences want it wherever they can get their hands on it. Um, so then onto the kind of game itself. And one of the things I love about Skyrim is just that enormous freedom and very real choice. So I think in lots of games that we think of as open world or games that have branching narratives and they say, you know, you can shape the story, you can become who you want to be in that story and you'll, you know, change how that world exists and how the story plays out. What they often mean is in one of three ways, <laughs> you know, Mass Effect, I'm looking at you, where I don't really get to make a decision. I'm not really weaving my way through that world. I'm just on one of several tracks. 
Whereas with Skyrim, I truly can be who I want to be. You know, I can adjust the difficulty. I can go where I want to go. I can look and be the kind of character that I want to be. I can ignore the storyline and have a, a deeply rewarding experience in that world. And I think there are very few games where you really have that genuine freedom. There are no two games of Skyrim that look the same. Whereas if you chat to a lot of people about a different open world game or branching narrative game, you'll say, oh, did you get this ending? Did you do that playthrough? Did you make that decision? It's so hard to do that with Skyrim. Nobody's played a game like yours. So for me, that's something really essential. Combat, super simple, super satisfying, no matter how you want to play. So I have a soft spot for Skyrim because it's one of the first games I played through kind of technically with my husband. So I played it on PS3, he played it on his PC, and we sat next to each other and played it at the same time, and we are completely different players. So I'm like a big barbarian style player, like two-handed weapons are my jam, whereas he's like a stealth archer. I hate it. But, <laughs> <laughs> and we, play style. Okay, all right. And we fell in love despite that, but you know. <laughs> it's like Romeo and Juliet. Yes, exactly, <laughs> two completely different worlds. And, uh, and I find that the combat is so enjoyable no matter how you want to play. So many games really, they're based around you know, a type of play or a, you know, they want you to do a certain thing and, and this will let you mix whatever you want. I love a bit of magic and a two-handed weapon and there's so few other games where I can, I can do that. I can truly craft what my combat style is going to be. And it's very simple to grasp. I don't have to learn 18 different stances or you know, find a specific weapon so that I can play as I want to. So I love that. Um, I think for me as well, a huge part of it is the modding community. And I don't know if this is cheating, because it's not, you know, the game didn't ship with all these mods. Is it cheating? What, what, what are we saying? Yeah. I get to decide. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Why is it Who wants to James jump in? At the risk of agreeing with her and making it easier for her, like, if, if the company enables mod support, then it's considered part of the game. All right. Because fine. they know that people are going to build this. Oh, you may continue. <laughs> Great, and that was going to be my argument, was hopefully that, you know, they do encourage it. It is, it was always intended to be in the game. They have always, you know, as I said, encouraged that community. Mm -hmm. They have recruited from that community. Mm -hmm. You know, some of why later editions of Skyrim and some of the DLC are so good is because they looked and, and said, he's making great stuff, let's just bring him in-house. And so, you know, that's... Do you that. think they hired the people that changed Swap Dragons for Thomas the Tank Engine? <laughs> I think that was the first hire. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys know what they're doing. Exactly. <laughs> they know what the people want. So, you know, I think that that, you know, that is encouraged. And so for me, I count it as part of the game. And I think it, the idea that people spend, y have spent years of their life creating, building for this world, that this enormous world is not big enough for them. They want to spend more time in it. They want to create stories and worlds and new places that they Because the original it. game was so lacking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Maybe a little more. Yeah, yeah. a little dry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> One of those games you get done in a weekend. <laughs> so, you know, I think for me, that's a real demonstration of the power that it's had on its play base mm. and how it makes people feel and how much they want to spend time in that world. James, that is a very strong pick to kick off uh, from, from Elle. Is that trophy already hers or do you have something else? I do have something else, but I am worrying about the trophy now. <laughs> <laughs> um, won't deny that Skyrim's absolutely a landmark moment in open world adventures. I would say the next landmark was The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I think most people know this game. Mm. This was a um, Switch launch title. It was also one Wii U. came out 2017. It was a complete reinvention of The Legend of Zelda series. And that started in 1986, and that was long before Elder Scrolls even started. That was the going out and exploring the world and having an adventure game. Like mm -hmm. they, they really tried with Breath of the Wild to go back into that core root of the original NES Zelda, which was you are dumped into a world, there is a whole world to explore, there's dungeons out there, there's baddies out there, best of luck, here's a sword. <laughs> um, Breath of the Wild obviously a bit more, a bit more uh, you know, eases you into it a bit better. For me, there are three things that I look for in a game to elevate a game above any form of entertainment. Not, not like, oh, I'm playing a movie. This is essentially, this is something that cannot be done in any form of entertainment. Exploration, agency, and to an extent, like storytelling, like doing something different with storytelling. Exploration, this has this in bucket loads. Like the, the, the world of Zelda is absolutely giant. You go from like snowy mountains to you know, vast scorching deserts. There's a lava covered volcano. Like it, it's such a beautiful and varied world. So many games kind of try and go for that realistic feel. Mm. Um, a realistic can actually feel a bit rubbish because we, we spend enough time in real life. I want to spend time in a beautiful, color, colorful. It's been likened to you know, the work of um, 
Miyazaki, like yeah, Miyazaki, yeah, Miyazaki, yeah. yeah. I panicked there. Um, <laughs> like it's been likened to Miyazaki in terms of his art style and the you know the size of it. There are so many things to find in the world. You would just, you cannot go any direction without stumbling upon something, whether it is a town or a shrine, like a little mini dungeon. More on those in a second, or um, <laughs> or even like like the little puzzles. So there's um, these little tree creatures called Koroks who appear when you complete a puzzle, and it can be something as simple as. There's a circle of rocks there, but there's one rock missing. I'm going to move that rock into that circle. Bang! Here you go. A Korok's here. I get a seed. Mm. Like, but it's as, as daft as that is. Like, it's really satisfying. Like finding these little puzzles and solving them as you go. Most games that have dungeons and so forth, and yeah, you know, Skyrim's got like caves and dungeons and so forth. They all are completed the way that the developer has designed. Like, you must follow the developer's uh, breadcrumbs, and you will you will stumble upon the solution that they have laid out for yeah. you. The shrines, so many of the shrines don't. They just allow you to do whatever you want. And so there's clearly a designed solution. Example I'll give you is there was a shrine where you've got to light a wooden torch and use it to set fire to like a, a line of like vines and ivies and stuff that's burnt out. And that flame will travel to the next, uh, to a barrier, a flammable barrier, which will disappear. And then you've got to quickly grab the flame and get to the next one. And it's this long maze-like thing of I need to set this on fire, then this on fire, then this on fire, and follow the flames all the way through until you get to the end. You've got a bag full of fire arrows <laughs> or a flaming greatsword. You can just carve your way straight through. Yeah. And it feels like cheating, mm. but it's not. It's the designer has designed this so that players can just use their initiative. And the, the way that Zelda players have, have exploited the systems and stuff that, um, that Nintendo... Nintendo has basically made a very systems-driven game. Mm. Like, they've just, rather than designing content and designing ways for people to interact with it, they've just designed systems and left it to it, mm. like, and left players to discover what the possibilities are. Since you mentioned Tears of the Kingdom, why pick Breath of the Wild over its sequel? I was, I was so tempted to pick Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> I am still playing that now. Tears of the Kingdom wouldn't be as good as it is without Breath of the Wild. Mm. Like, you can't get to one, you can't pick like Tears of the Kingdom and like have it stand up on its own merits to an extent. You have to acknowledge mm. Breath of the Wild. Without Breath of the Wild, there wouldn't be a Tears of the Kingdom. I love the way the story is told yeah. um, with, you know, games like Skyrim and other games, like they, it's a lot of like cutscenes and people talking at you. And there's a lot of like exposition essentially to get a story across. Zelda has an incredibly subtle way of telling a story. Like the Zelda stories historically haven't been like the most renowned narratives in video games. Mm. But this one, I think, is really special. This one, um, essentially, the game is set after kind of an apocalypse, like, you know, the, the Dark Lord has taken over, etc. cetera. Mm. But that was your fault. You mm. play Link as he's woken up after 100 years. Everything you see, all the ruin and devastation, is your fault. You are trying to account for your failings. And then you, as you journey and you learn what happened to Zelda, Zelda is usually little more than a princess that needs to be saved. In this one, like, she's an academic. She's a scientist. She wants to know and learn how... how this world works and what they can use to defeat Ganon using the purposes of available to them because she's struggling to tap into her chosen destined powers, which is, you know, the pressure on her. It look, really looks like the pressure on her to be this princess of destiny, whereas that's not what she wants to be. She wants to be this academic. All of that is conveyed. Oh, no, then, then there's like a whole Lord of the Rings style journey with the champions <laughs> to take Zelda to different places in, yeah. um, in the world to realize his powers. All of that is conveyed in a handful of cutscenes that are mm. one to two minutes long, mm. and you get the sense of this incredible epic journey, but if you put all the, you know, the cutscenes and the storyline together, it's about half an hour. Yeah. One thing I do find a bit lacking in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom is just the lack of like, full voice acting and performances. That's the only thing that would... Oh, interesting. That's uh, something we've addressed yet. Yeah, that would be something that would elevate it a little bit more for me if it, if it was more than just, ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting I, you said that, because when you were saying that you love the story in it. That was actually going to be one of my points, is that I have always, I'm somebody who was a very, very kind of early original Zelda fan. Mm. And for me, I feel as though the story has never progressed. The thing for me is that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom have felt like big toy boxes. They're wonderful to mm. explore. They want you to you know, play with things and build and experiment. But I don't feel as though I'm in a world with a story, with stakes, with meaning. It, it has always felt very much like I can do what I want because nothing really matters and I can, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't for me feel as though I've fallen into a, a real world, which is kind of what I was talking about with Skyrim, the storytelling in that really captures me. I grant you, I, I grant you like, but Nintendo's priority is usually the exploration, the agency and the, the playing thing and like the, the narrative is the, the framing device that, that mm. sets up the setting. I, so I grant you that, but like I still, 
I can't even remember what the storyline of Skyrim is. Something about dragons and destiny. <laughs> <laughs> like, genuine, like, 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 genuine. And like, yeah, you can't you, remember what one of the storylines is. Okay, yeah, there's there's gr- thousands gr- of storylines gr- you could enjoy. Gr- gr- there's lots of storylines in there. But, you know, there's lots of story- Tears of the Kingdom would be a better choice for this, but like the personal stories, that all the side quests in Tears of the Kingdom have such a personal story. And there's a lot of that in Breath of the Wild as well, like the personal stories of all these different characters. These characters who are trying to find a way to live in this world which has basically been devastated by this giant evil that you let loose and you didn't <laughs> stop. You didn't stop. I feel like it's, it's easy to say, oh, they just put little bits in so you can just imagine whatever story you want. <laughs> Whereas, you know, with Skyrim, there are thousands and thousands of handcrafted storylines of pieces of lore, of books you can read where you find a fascinating story from hundreds of years ago in that world and it will lead I don't know, you I, somewhere. I tend to get bored of reading like the, the many encyclopedias you find and you're reading like two pages of encyclopedia. <laughs> but the game doesn't make you do that. No, you know, that is okay, yeah. you know, If you want to find it, you don't have to go and find a YouTube community who's dissecting <laughs> a triangle they found. You know, it's, it's there for you to explore. Like I, I love the idea of somebody telling me a story. That's what I love mm. is I want to know that I'm in a crafted world because I can imagine a story I can just close my eyes and go ahead and do that you know (laughs) (laughs) what I want is to know that somebody with a brilliant mind crafted a world for me to discover and find things in and and for me Skyrim does that so much better than than Zelda okay so Rob two games there Mm. Skyrim Breath of the Wild widely considered to be among the best ever no one will question that (laughs) are they the best ever and if not what is they are not the best ever. Not for me, anyway. And obviously, this whole thing is very subjective. As, as we said, I'm top. It's line. subjective until I decide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Officially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Objectively, what is best? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like I said at the start, I kind of took the opposite approach for James. I didn't look at any what are the best games of all time mm. list. So I kind of I went more with one that I have like a big personal connection with, which is Star Wars: Knights of the Old Republic uh, from 2003. Uh, it is an RPG. I mean, some would say maybe it's influenced both of the other games that have been mentioned here today. <laughs> um, and the kind of, it's one of those, like, I remember the story around how I got this game so well as well. There was um, one copy of this game amongst, like, the group of nerds at my school, basically. Mm. You know, five discs encased in a, a plastic box. Yeah. They got kind of passed around from person to person, <laughs> as if, like, the Bible was being, like, spread <laughs> yeah, yeah. amongst the group. We yeah. were gradually being... You must experience this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I remember there being so much chatter around it. It was this great game. It was this great story. It was this great twist as well. And I actually foolishly asked someone what the twist was before it was my turn to play it, so I knew what no. was coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even with that in mind, I think I managed to, like, not forget, but, like, put it... Mm. Back to the back of my mind as much as I could. So the setup of this game is you wake up, you kind of design your player character and they wake up on a spaceship in the middle of a kind of space battle. Mm. Uh, it's a few thousand years before the events of the Star Wars films. Uh, they wanted to say a thousand generations before, but then Lucasfilm were like, we need a specific, you need to put a number on this. Yeah, cause... yeah, we need to mark it on the timeline. <laughs> yeah, or... yeah. <laughs> the Star Wars fans will be furious. Yeah. Uh, you wake up on a, on a spaceship, your character, I mean, classic video game trope, your character's got amnesia, which mm-hmm. actually have all of our characters got amnesia. It's a great jumping off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so your character wakes up, they're um, kind of quickly introduced to kind of, at this point in the Star Wars timeline, uh, it's, you know, kind of prior to the prequel, so there's loads of Jedi running around, mm-hmm. and actually because of more recent events, there's also loads of Sith running around, because these two Jedis, Revan and Malak, uh, kind of went out into the kind of outer rim of the galaxy and they kind of came back Sith Lords with the whole Sith Armada and a kind of space station which is basically like the era version of the, the Death Star. Mm. Uh, and so these guys have come back, there's now kind of Jedi and Sith are at war and that's the battle that this spaceship is in the middle of. And each planet is kind of its own kind of self-contained story with its own characters and lots of kind of player agency which I think again is something that, that kind of links our games together. Uh, you can kind of approach things in different ways. It's kind of a light side path and a dark side path that you can take. And I just remember it being at the time, and still probably to this day, the most immersed I've felt in a world that I kind of already loved, because mm. I've always been a big Star Wars fan. Maybe that is obvious. I was actually playing it recently on Switch, because, I mean, shout out to Aspire, who are the company who keep porting it onto new things, which is <laughs> very helpful. So you can play it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I was playing it on Switch, and I found a whole uh, storyline that I hadn't found before which was there was like this bounty hunter guy in the corner of one of the, the spaceports and he'll kind of send you on like some black ops assassination missions basically, mm. which I'd never <laughs> found before, so that was cool. I don't think there's a light side way of doing them which kind of wrecked my, <laughs> my, my playthrough because I really wanted to do them. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of yeah, builds up to, uh, in, and I think it speaks to how good the story is that even like 
20, 20 years on since it came out. Mm. Yeah, I still would feel bad spoiling what the, what the twist is yeah. like with all these cameras pointed at me. It would feel like breaking the law. <laughs> um, but basically, the, this big twist occurs. It makes the story a lot more personal and ties your uh, custom character who you kind of kind of created at the start and you've been building up along the way ties them in like a much bigger way into the larger narrative. They um, the developers said they wanted it to be like that equivalent moment from Empire Strikes Back of mm. um, I am your father. But how do we do that? for a, a player character who you've created to go, oh, this other character you met as your father uh, maybe doesn't really mean anything, but the way they tie it in is so beautiful. And then it kind of builds up to a great finale. Well, movie tie-in games and, and spin-offs don't have the best mm. reputation. What pitfalls would you say this game avoided? I think it avoided being like an overt movie tie-in. I think if mm. the same team with even the same resources and the same cast mm. if they had been told because it was a t at the, around the same time the prequels were going on yeah well, it was, and it was an option right that they were going to do a game based on episode two attack of the clones yeah, that's yeah. the other option or to do this prequel yeah i think if they had done like an attack of the clones game or like a prequel era game i think he would have i think it avoided the pitfall of well we know what's going to happen as much as like the spider-man 2 movie game is a good example of it's a like they literally have the scenes from the movie in the game yeah. toby Maguire's voice is in the game but they still managed to add in kind of side plots and other things that, that weren't in the movie, so you've at least got a bit of variety and new stuff to discover. But I think it avoided that pitfall of, well, we're replaying events that we've already seen, and, you know, of, especially at that time, it'd be like, and, the, and the, it visually looks worse than, than a Hollywood film. <laughs> yeah. um, um, but no, it kind of avoids that pitfall completely. I think it manages to... Actually, one of the closest experiences is, remember that first time that you saw Force Awakens in mm. the cinema? And it's like, it feels like... Star Wars, as I remember it, and yeah. not, not those kind of later viewings where you might have like nitpicked all yeah. kind of the, the moments. It's that kind of feeling of it feels like Star Wars, but it's not the Star Wars that I've seen a hundred times. Yeah. It, it, it's evolved it. It's added all this different stuff, all these new things to discover. And you I felt the force. Yeah, I felt the force. Yeah. It was really <laughs> strong with me. Well, Radio Times audience has also been having their say on this topic across Facebook, X and uh, threads. So the results of our fan poll are in. We've got a top five and interestingly, None of your choices here today are on it. So they were all wrong. They were all yeah, that many people. <laughs> no, no, no. So, the viewers were all wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So at number five, with two percent of the vote, because it's very hotly contested. At number five, you have GoldenEye sixty-four. I thought uh, I thought James might pick that. I was I was tempted, but like that was beaten by its own spiritual successor, Perfect Dark. So it's like I, it's it's not even the best. Bond-like game. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> At number four, you have the original Resident Evil 2 uh, with 3% okay. of the vote. Yeah. Uh, number three, GTA 5, 4% of the vote. Uh, number two, Halo 3 with 5% of the vote. Mm. And at number one, Half-Life 2 with 6% of the total vote. All great games. Mm. All yeah, great games. Surprising, yeah. Yeah. Very good games. Uh, the remaining 80% was made up of many votes for many other games, including Super Mario 64, Fallout 3, Borderlands 2, Uncharted 2, Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, even a few votes in there for Pac-Man. <laughs> um, keep your eyes peeled uh, to Radio Time's social feeds for more best ever polls coming soon. But the time has come to find out which of you has emerged triumphant in this PvP. <laughs> <laughs> L, you argued that Skyrim was the best ever video game. James, you are backing Breath of the Wild. And Rob, your vote went to Knights of the Old Republic. But which of you is going to emerge triumphant and collect our best ever trophy? It's really difficult. Rob, I feel like you have a lot of affection for Knights of the Old Republic. <laughs> and doesn't it rub off on you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it does, it does. It is, it is infectious, but I feel like you may have made a fatal error by picking your favourite as opposed to necessarily the best I shouldn't ever. have said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could. James, you made this case that Breath of the Wild, it took what Skyrim did and built on it, but I feel like L, you argued back, you argued strong. So I am, I am going to say, because it has that incredible, expansive world, as you say, so many different story strands. For all the reasons you have put forward, L, I am going to say that officially the best ever video game is Skyrim. Thank so, L, you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Rudging applause from your fellow competitors. Well, I feel like, you know, I mean, 
well thought here. This was <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> I feel incredible to be standing here holding this trophy because I was doing this for the Skyrim community. It's such a big community. It's a really warm, wonderful place. And I just wanted to do it justice. And look, I did. I feel amazing. <laughs> on the one hand, I'm annoyed that L1. On the other hand, I'm more annoyed that I don't have Skyrim on my Switch with me for the journey home. I feel slightly shortchanged. Like, I felt that I could have convinced Morgan. Like, I know him to be a big sci-fi person. I did think there was a chance my argument might have, you know, compelled him to, to pick it, but sadly not, but it would always be, you know, the best ever in my heart. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Best Ever. What did you make of our verdict, and what do you think is the best ever video game? Let us know on X at Radio Times. We're bringing you new episodes of The Best Ever Weekly, so be sure to head to radiotimes.com forward slash The Best Ever for all the latest news and exclusive content from each new episode. If you're listening to the podcast, you can also subscribe and review The Best Ever on your podcast outlet of choice. That's all for now, but join us again soon for more of The Best Ever.